Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. I'm sure you'll probably recognize my my guest slash coworker today, Dallas Barber, our big game biologist. Yeah, great to be here, Todd. Thanks for having me. You know, Dallas, um, every year we bring a special deer season preview episode. Yeah. It's usually you and I just sitting right here on my truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Today's not going to be much different. You've heard home is where the heart is. Well, deer camp is where my truck is. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a it's a great time of year. Uh, kind of the, the thing that we always look forward to as deer hunters. Um, we're about a week out from season. So uh, everybody's kind of gearing up and getting ready. I know a lot of people are kind of concerned with some of the drought that's been going on, which um, is a viable, you know, concern. But what we see with drought a lot of the times is that we have higher harvest during drought. Um, deer are having to move a lot farther to kind of reach those those needs they have, food, cover, water, um, spread out a little bit. So deer are kind of more vulnerable being on their feet for, for longer periods during the day. And also you can sure see a heck of a lot more. Um, with all the foliage being off the trees, grass heights being shorter, you know, deer are just a lot more visible, which leads to higher harvest. You know, another recurring theme that we'll we'll get to later today is also trying to hammer home antlerless harvest. Yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things that, that you can't really take off the gas pedal. Um, you know, to achieve our goal of 40 to 45% every year, we really need our hunters to, to be kind of our tools as, as management, um, you know, officials on the ground, so to speak. Sure. So they're the people that kind of put our recommendations into work. They're doing a great job this year. I actually just checked after muzzleloader season, we're sitting at about 52% uh, antlerless harvest which is a good head start for rifle where a bulk of our, our harvest occurs. Well that's great. Well every year for our deer season preview episode I kind of put you on the spot and yeah. have you answer some tough questions and this year we thought we might kind of help spread the load a little bit. Yeah I'm appreciative of it. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago we actually made a post on social media uh, soliciting folks if they've ever had a question they wanted to ask one of our biologists or game wardens about deer, deer management, deer regulations, to uh, post it in the comments. Yeah. So what we've done today is that we've we've taken some of those questions from that actual post, and we've gone to the field and asked some of our wildlife technicians, biologists, and game wardens to to help with the heavy lifting and answer some of those questions for you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hear what they have to say. What do you say we get started? Yeah, let's dive in. Okay, so our first question comes from Stephen F. He says, what's the best ratio of buck to doe for the healthiest herd? The ideal buck to doe ratio would be one to two. This would promote a more intense rut, fawns be born closer to the same time frame, which would cut down on fawn mortality. Also, the tighter buck to doe ratio, this will entail a healthier deer going into the wintertime, meaning less stressed. We, as hunters, wildlife conservationists across Oklahoma see when we have a higher delta buck ratio, this causes a longer breeding season. More bucks being stressed going into the winter time, fawns being born later in the year when natural vegetation food sources are more limited, which causes more stress in the does. If you are wanting to see more mature, healthier deer in the deer herd, you will need to manage the herd on your property and work with your neighbors on management. You will need to keep your habitat highly productive keep the deer herd at a stable population. By having a tighter buck to doe ratio, you can have a healthier deer, productive habitat, and more enjoyable hunts in the field. Yeah, hey, thanks Tony for that answer. A lot of really good points there. Our second question uh, comes from Ryan T. And he says, how do you actually determine the age of a deer? And for that, we're gonna pitch that to Emily Clark, our big game technician. Hi, I'm Emily Clark, big game technician for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife. I'm going to show you today how we age deer here in Oklahoma using the tooth wear interruption method on deer jaws. So deer typically have six teeth. Uh, as they're erupting, if they have five or less, they are automatically a fawn, like this little guy. Once they have their teeth grown in and they still have their baby teeth, like this tricuspid, you know that deer is a year and a half. Once they lose those baby teeth and the teeth have set, you know that deer is at least two and a half. From there, that's where the wear pattern comes in, and we start looking at the enamel, which is the white, versus the dentine, the brown. As the deer teeth age, they, uh, that dentine gets wider and wider, and they have certain patterns each year uh, for that wear pattern. Um, it can vary a little bit based on diet. Um, if a deer has more sand in their diet, for instance, it might wear a little faster, uh, but generally it wears the same way. Um, but basically we age deer in half year increments since they are born in the spring, usually killed in the fall. 
Um, so that's why we age them two and a half, three and a half, etc. cetera. Uh, we generally age up to six and a half past that. They're just old. You get kind of funky ones like this where they have cavities or broken teeth, usually from eating corn. And uh, this deer is six and a half plus. Um, so it's, it's a little hard to tell because of the wear patterns, but um, yeah. So if you're curious how to age your deer, uh, you can submit pictures of your deer jaw to our website, wildlifedepartment.com, and search Age My Deer, and we're happy to age your deer for you. Good luck this fall. All right, moving right along. Our next question is from Rabitsky L. They ask, how do you count deer or come up with a statewide estimate? Hi, I'm technician Banta. I work on the Hickory Creek and Love Valley wildlife management areas in South Central Oklahoma. Now the question that was posed today is how do we as an agency count deer? And how do we come up with statewide deer estimates as well? Oh dear. No, that's a great question. And I tell you, it's a little easier on a localized level to be precise and accurate. For instance, here on Hickory Creek and really many of our WMAs throughout the state, not to mention our DMAP lands that are actually privately owned, we do deer spotlight counts every year. Now these counts are done at the exact same time every year along the exact same routes and they're replicated each year. So when we look at these numbers year over year and really even decade over decade, it gives us a pretty accurate assessment of our overall deer numbers, deer density, and also gives us a look at buck and doe ratios as well as our annual fawn recruitment as well. Now on a statewide level, when you're trying to get deer estimates as far as exact numbers on deer, it's kind of difficult, but our deer biologists do have some very important tools in their toolbox. One of those being our statewide deer harvest totals. Now, these vary a little bit from year to year, depending on a lot of different factors, things like weather conditions during peak hunting seasons. But when they look at it year over year, it gives them a really accurate gauge of where our deer numbers are at. And I'm happy to report to you that our deer numbers in Oklahoma are high, and we pray that they always will be. But not only can they look at these at a statewide level, but they can look at various aspects of our harvest, such as percentage of doe harvest up against total deer harvest, and break it down not only statewide, but region by region. So listen, that's why it's so important that you give accurate information when you check your deer in this year. And I hope that answered your question. Good luck in the woods. You know, Todd, David brought up a lot of really good points about an estimate for deer population. A lot of people see estimates from some of our western states where they're counting the individual number of, say, elk or, or other animals like that, where they're able to fly those surveys with a helicopter during times of the year where all of those animals are really, you know, kind of congregated in one spot where they can get a really good estimate. Here in Oklahoma, not exactly possible. Tree cover, canopy cover, things like that can really get in the way. So those spotlight surveys David talked about are kind of our bread and butter for estimating deer population. Dallas, the next question is about chronic wasting disease. Yeah. And we actually had several mm -hmm. about CWD. Uh, Gwen P asks, I know the concern for controlling the spread of CWD and what must be done to prevent its spread in areas affected, but what can be done to eliminate it and reduce the populations and areas that are affected? So interesting question. Um, CWD, once it is in a population, it is not likely to be eliminated. It is a long-standing um, infectious material that can remain in soils. It can be uptake by plant roots. Um, so really our emphasis is on controlling the spread. Um, measures to do that are creating surveillance areas where we contain carcasses, uh, make sure that we have proper carcass disposal for hunter harvested deer, and also just make sure that we're not artificially transporting those infectious materials or prions in the back of a pickup truck. Uh, other aspects that we could do to slow the spread of this disease is to make sure that we have adequate harvest of deer. To a large measure, CWD is a density dependent uh, disease and that it means that the greater the deer density, the more likelihood is that an infected deer is going to come in contact with a non-infected deer and spread it and continue the cycle. So measures such as possibly increasing bag limits, possibly increasing season lengths, um, different aspects such as that could be looked at in the future should we need to, to go the route of trying to reduce CWD transmission. But the main thing we can do right now is just make sure that we're not artificially spreading that disease by taking infected parts 
uh, and not disposing of those carcass remains in a safe and approved manner. Well, Dallas, actually, this year we've had a deer that was infected with CWD close enough to Oklahoma borders that it it uh, uh, caused us to activate our, our response. Yeah, yeah. so we uh, were kind of forced to, to activate our response plan here. We had a deer that was about two and a half miles south of our border with Texas, um, just south of Boise City. So part of that response plan included uh, developing an SSA, or a special surveillance area. Jerry covered a little bit of it there in his answer, but essentially that is, is creating an area where uh, highly infected material cannot come out of that area. So, you know, the only way for you to be able to bring a deer out of that area Area or elk, since this does in fact, you know, impact cervids as a whole. Um, it's got to be those same kind of parts that we don't allow from out of state to come into state. So, you know, cleaned quarters uh, can't contain any spinal column. Uh, heads can come in, but they've got to be cleaned of all tissues. So, you know, it, it gives some wiggle room for people to be able to go to uh, their taxidermists, but at the same time, we're trying to mitigate as much risk as humanly possible uh, for the spread of that disease. And, you know, one other thing that has come in that SSA is our uh, sample drop-off freezer. Mm -hmm. So we're asking hunters that harvest a deer or an elk in Cimarron County uh, to allow us to test that animal. So we've got a, a freezer set up there in Boise City. I was actually just there, you know, a couple weeks ago getting that dropped off. Shot a couple videos for you guys and hopefully we'll be able to, to watch them right here. I'm here at Moore's Food Pride in Cimarron County, which is the new location of our new CWD drop-off freezer. Super easy process, just bring your deer here, you'll see our ice chest that's sitting out front, lop that head off, put it in a bag, fill out the necessary information, and we'll have that deer tested for you. This is gonna be a really easy process. So whenever you get to the cooler, inside you're gonna find some Sharpies, some trash bags, and these data sheets. And that's what you're gonna need to fill out before you put your head in. So on top, you'll find all the instructions as to how we want those samples to be submitted and a QR code. And so if you'll just scan that with your phone camera, it'll bring up all of the information on chronic wasting disease on our wildlife department website. Well, Dallas, hopefully with these measures, we can kind of mitigate the impact of CWD. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the goal for, for that regulation as a whole. You know, this it's such a hot topic. You've actually got another question there from yeah. the viewer. Yeah, so our next one uh, comes from Ryan W. And it says, what do the early signs of chronic wasting disease look like inside of a harvested deer? Kind of a two-part question here. And can tuberculosis be spread from deer to people as well as symptoms of positive deer? So we're going to kick that to Jalen Flynn, your Carter County Game Warden. There are no early signs of CWD. Animals can appear to be perfectly healthy for 18 to 24 months before showing clinical symptoms, which makes this disease so hard to manage. The other question is, can tuberculosis be passed from deer to humans as well as, positive, as, well as symptoms of positive deer? While TB can infect humans, there has never been a case of bovine TB within Oklahoma deer. This is something that is stringently tested for within our cattle industry. Hey, thanks, Jalen. Uh, that's actually something that makes it really difficult for us as, as wildlife managers to, to manage a disease. When chronic wasting disease doesn't really show any clinical symptoms at all until you know pretty late in the, in the life of that disease. So deer can be running around in a field, you can be watching deer, and they could be CWD positive. It makes it really difficult for, for us to, to manage that. Absolutely. Well, we know that you're doing everything that can possibly do, mm -hmm. be done, and we appreciate that. Okay, our next question, uh, changing the pace a little bit. This one is from Sherry M. She says, my daughter is nine years old and wants to deer hunt. What are the requirements for her and do I need a license to take her? And we're gonna throw this one to our hunter ed coordinator, Lance Meek. I'm, I'm, it's great that you're trying to take your nine year old hunting with you. Now, nine year olds are unable to sign up and take the hunter education course in Oklahoma. Um, it's 10 and older for the hunter education course. However, they can hunt using an apprentice designated license. Um, what that requires is that they have a, another hunter with them who is hunter ed certified and licensed, and they need to be close enough to take control of the firearm, basically. Actually, any age, can hunt with that apprentice designated license. So if you have an opportunity to go hunting and you're older than that, but you just haven't got your hunter ed done yet, 
you can also go online and purchase our apprentice designated license. If you have hunter education and you're unable to find it, go on our website, wildlifedepartment.com, and you can find it on there. If you're unable to find it and it is the very last minute, you can still hunt as an apprentice hunter, but you'll have to follow all of those rules until you find your hunter ed card. Andrew N., he asks, why do deer season regulations vary so much from one public area to another, and why aren't they all the same? The deer season regulations may vary from one of our wildlife management areas to another across the state, primarily because each management area population of deer is assessed and it's determined what type of hunting pressure it can support given our management objectives for the deer herd on those areas. And so then we try to set the regulations to help us achieve those goals. Uh, we do try to stay somewhat consistent, at least within regions, as much as possible. Again, given what our management objectives are for the deer herd on, on those areas. But uh, we will see some variation, especially as you move from one end of the state to another, just because of different habitat types, production capabilities, and hunting pressure that occurs on those areas. You know, Scott, those are some really good points, and I kind of wanted to follow up a little bit there. Um, you know, Oklahoma is one of the most ecologically diverse states in the country, and we really have to kind of manage our wildlife as such. Some of the methods, techniques, season links, regulations that we use in areas where deer density is lower, say up in the Panhandle, uh, should be drastically different than what we use on some of our more densely populated, uh, you know, WMA, something like Fort Gibson or, or another one where we've got tons and tons of deer that equals tons and tons of opportunity. Very good point. Okay, you ready for our last question? Yep. Last question from social media is from Barry R. And he asks, on my acreage, I have four resident does and at least 15 bucks pass through. I understand the thought of harvesting a doe, but my ratio is way out of whack. Should I really continue to harvest doe or stay with harvesting only a buck? Not all properties in Oklahoma are the same. When you are trying to manage your property to be the best it can be, a proper buck to doe ratio is an important factor that needs to be kept in check. Balance is the key to a healthy deer herd. You can do this by trying to achieve a one to one or one to two buck to doe ratio. You will want to maximize your deer herd potential by removing the yearly surplus. Harvest the mature bucks that you believe have reached their potential and leave the bucks that are in the three and a half to four and a half year range. Don't be afraid to harvest a few younger bucks to help bring your property back into balance. Well, this has been kind of fun and a little bit different, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I am so ready for deer gun season. It looks like we finally got some rain. Yeah. The weather looks like it's gonna cooperate, mm -hmm. so I'm ready. Yeah, there should be uh, no reason to not be out in the woods. And you know, one thing that I do want to kind of nail home for people is that every time that you go hunt and you pull that trigger, you're making a management decision for your property. So, you know, I urge you guys to, to do so wisely. Uh, you know, hunters in the know, let young bucks grow and take a doe. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of reasons why uh, this stuff works. Absolutely. Well, we hope that you have an incredibly safe and memorable deer season this year. For all of us at your wildlife department, thanks for joining us for our 2022 deer season special. Welcome to the ODWC Test Kitchen. My name is Smokey Solis, and today we're making baking pan deer sliders. <laughs> These deer sliders are a great addition to any tailgate or family gathering that you might be having around the corner, but also it's a great way to get rid of that um, last season's deer meat that you might still have in your freezer. It's really simple. All you need is some deer meat and spices and some chopped onion and some rolls and you're really good to go. Now to start, I already have the oven preheated to 400. Um, the next thing we need to do is get these chopped onions sauteed 
until they're translucent. So uh, let's get that started. So first off, we're gonna just cook these, saute them until they're translucent. You don't have to worry about them being all the way cooked through as they will cook some more with the meat. All right, so the onions are just about done cooking. They're about translucent. So the next step is to add about two pounds of deer meat to that pan. And we're gonna make sure that it's thoroughly browned with those onions. All right, so while that meat's browning back there, we're gonna think about the spices that we wanna add into this dish. So today we're gonna to use some salt and some pepper. And one of my favorite things to use is this ranch seasoning packet. But this is a great way to make things easy on yourself and just add it into really any dish that you'd like to add some great flavors. All right, so let's get our pepper in there. And this is just salt to pepper salt and pepper to taste for you. So to taste just means however you'd prefer. Um, you don't wanna over salt or over season this, um, just like you wouldn't wanna do with any dish, but really just to what you prefer. We're just gonna dump that whole ranch packet in there. You wanna get this mixed around. Make sure it's thoroughly mixed in there. You don't wanna really see any any of that ranch powder on the meat. All right, so I finished up back there with the meat. It's just off to the side, cooling off for a second. Um, and so now we're gonna focus on the rolls. Now, right here, I have a sheet of the Hawaiian rolls from the grocery store. Um, I think that these are a great choice for really any kind of little sandwich or slider that you're gonna do. Um, you're gonna keep them as this sheet all together, and we're gonna just cut down horizontally and you'll have one big top and bottom half. You wanna use a serrated knife for this. So next, I think this meat's cooled off quite a bit now. We're just gonna add a, probably about two cups of whatever kind of shredded cheese you want. I'm using a shredded cheddar mix. So it's gonna bring a little bit of tanginess into this dish. We're gonna mix that around. You want this cooled off so it doesn't completely melt. And we'll finish off the melting process in the oven. All right, so now that we got the cheese mixed in there, we're just gonna start adding it to our bottom half of the buns. You wanna try to get as much on there as possible without it overspilling. But you want these things packed And now we're just going to flip the top sheet of buns onto it. See if we can do this well. Boop. Your next step is to just brush some butter on top of these buns. It's gonna, of course, anything with butter on it's good, but that's gonna help them get toasted pretty well. All right, so now that we got those buns buttered up, we're gonna pop them into a 400 degree oven. We're gonna let that go for about 15 or 20 minutes or until they're golden brown on top. All right, so it's been about 15 minutes. I pulled these out of the oven. They're golden brown on top, just like we want them. And now the next step, you're just gonna take a spatula and cut down these seams here. I made this sauce just simply with some ketchup, mayonnaise, pickles, and some spices. I'm just gonna try one without it though. That is great. Check out this recipe, give it a try, experiment a little bit, and enjoy. That's so good. I think that'll be good.